Uh, Janisha, you're muted right now. Your mic is muted. Uh, I think there's a connection problem at Janusha's place. Uh, I welcome you all for this webinar. So we will wait for Janisha to come back. Maybe there's a connection problem at her place. Yes, we can hear you, Janisha. Yes. Uh, very good morning to everyone. I'm Janisha Bouron, a telecommunications engineering student and the chair of IEEE UM student branch. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the YouTube channel of the IEEE BUBT student branch. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to our third PSD webinar organized by the IEEE University of Mauritius and the IEEE Bangladesh University of Business and Technology. Today's theme for the presentation is the growing importance of power system flexibility in the clean energy revolution. Before we get started, I would like to pass on to Mr. Yashtia Gopi, the Vice Chair of IEEE UM Student Branch to share a few words with us. Over to you, Yashtia. Uh, thank you, Jayasha. Uh, hello, everyone. I welcome you all once again. And we are glad today to have attendees from both Mauritius and Bangladesh. Uh, today's event marks our first collaboration with a foreign Atropoli student branch. Uh, we thank you, Atropoli Bangladesh University of Business Technology for making this collaboration possible. We hope for many more collaborations with many more student branches all around the world in the future. We're also looking towards involving many more student members in our projects. Today's event is also our last webinar on the occasion of PESJ, but we do have some other awesome activities coming up. Uh, PSJ commemorates the day, 22nd April 2008, when the Power Engineering Society changed its name to Power and Energy Society to focus on helping the environment. The theme for PSD this year is Clean Energy Revolution. As we know, the production of energy is one of the greatest contributors to climate change. There's a need to sensitize and educate everyone on the solutions and technological development that are happening to slow down this issue. I'm going to repeat something from yesterday's webinar. Our generation needs to be the first and last generation to be fighting this issue of climate change, as we cannot let this continue to be an issue to the next generation. This is why at IEEE and IEEE University of Mauritius, we have been organizing so many webinars and activities during this month of April to make us conscious of the different solutions available today on this issue. And we are thankful to Dr. Ori to be our keynote speaker for today. And I'm sure we'll all have a very full webinar today. Uh, thank you very much. And so back to you, Janisha. Thank you very much for these words, Yashtia. And now we'll have Farsin Safa from IEEE BUBT student branch. Over to you, Farsin. Farsin, are you, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you to all the honorable guests, faculty members, and students for your cooperation. 
that is must for all the times. It has been a pleasure being with all of you today. And again, thank you all for your patience. I wish you all a very good evening. Stay safe and still there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farsin. Now, before the presentation begins, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Vishwamitra Ori. Uh, Dr. Ori works as a senior lecturer at the University of Mauritius and is currently the head of electrical and electronic engineering department. His primary research interest centers around renewable energy technologies and their integration in the power grid system. Also, we'll be having a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, where you'll have the opportunity to ask any questions related to the presentation. You may send in your questions at, to the chat at any time. We'll be sharing an attendance form to the chat shortly. Make sure to fill it in to get your e-certificate. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Ori, the floor is yours. Uh, Dr. Ori. Dr. Ori, are you here? All right. Uh, we'll Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Can you hear yes. me? Right. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I think I think someone muted my, my, my microphone, so it wasn't me. Uh, so please, uh, you, can you check whether everything is okay? So then I'm missed out, right? Okay, so uh, it's okay, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, again, thank thank you, Miss Miss Puan. So it's my pleasure to be in your midst to today, and I would like to thank the student branches of IEEE Mauritius and Bangladesh sections for having kindly invited me to give a talk, right? So, uh, as you know, uh, Yashti briefed you about the theme of the PESD this year, Clean Energy Revolution. And when I was thinking about a title for my talk, uh, well, uh, I chose this title, The Growing Importance of Our System Flexibility in the Clean Energy Revolution. Why I chose this? Because it was the most obvious title to me, given I, that I wanted to focus on the electrical energy aspect of that energy revolution. You see, nowadays, if you, if you look at recent reports on the future of power systems, right, it's very difficult to find one which will not highlight the crucial, vital, decisive, key, central or essential role played by uh, flexibility in electrical systems of the near future, right? So in this slide, I'm just showing you some excerpts from some headlines, if you want, from some of the recent uh, reports on the future of the power systems. And you will see that the adjectives used may change, but the place of flexibility in the clean energy revolution is clear. So this provides the, uh, the rationale behind me choosing such a title. So in this presentation, first of all, uh, my objective is to give you a brief overview of power system flexibility and its importance in the grid, right? So to start with, I'll just elaborate on some of the problems posed by the integration of variable renewable energy resources, BRES, in the grid. Then, I will try to explain 
how these problems escalate as the share of VREs in the power grid increase. Then we will see a definition of power system flexibility and how it can be uh, given, how you can get sources of power system flexibility on the grid. And then to conclude, I'll just touch upon some major research questions that are related to power system flexibility. Most of you present here to today are students. So maybe, maybe you will be interested on what research is presently going on on power system flexibility. Now, another thing is that given I know that many first year and second year students are in the audience today. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as basic as possible, right? So I'm going to start from the basics and then, grow, uh, and then go forward. Good. So to start with, let's have a look at the Paris, Paris Agreement. It's also known as the Paris Climate Accord or sometimes at the COP21 Accord. So this is an agreement among the leaders of over 180 countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to limit the global temperature increase to below two degrees Celsius, right, by the year of 2100. So many countries have already signaled their intent to achieve uh, uh, this target. And for this, they have targeted to get net zero carbon emissions by 2050. They have also decided, I mean, they have set tar tar targets for 50% reduction in their total energy demand by 2050 with respect to the levels they, 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 they were at in the year 2010 and also to decarbonize the electricity supply, right? So, which means that if we want to constrain the global temperature rise below two degrees Celsius, right? It will require the global energy system to undergo a comprehensive transformation from one that was largely okay, based upon fossil fuels to one that is dominated by renewable energy sources. So in this context, in this context of uh, reaching this two degrees centigrade, uh, keep the temperature within that uh, lim limit, right? The, internal re the International Renewable Energy Agency, also known as IRENA, has drawn a scenario for electricity generation, right? So according to this scenario, you will see here, by 2050, okay, the share of renewable energy in the power sector would need to more than triple its current rate here, 24%, it needs to reach 85% by the year 2050. So that reaching this uh, two, two degrees Celsius target is reasonable, okay? Out of this 85%, 36% of the total global electric generated will be expected to come from wind energy and around 22% from solar PV as shown here. Right? So this scenario, it implies that many countries will need to gradually transform their power system so that solar and wind will become the backbone of, the of their electricity supply by 2050. So when we see this, the question that comes to our mind is the following, you know, if there are so many plans set by countries to significantly increase the share of renewable energy, such as PV solar or wind in the power grid. Why are things moving so slowly? You know, why are we not moving faster? If you asked such a question to power system experts 20 years ago, they would surely say that PV solar and wind, they are too expensive as compared to fossil fuels. However, Nowadays, solar PV and wind are cost competitive with those conventional energy sources in many regions of the world. So then, what really is the problem? In fact, the problem comes from the characteristics of what we call variable renewable energy resources, or sometimes we call them intermittent renewable energy sources. They differ considerably from that of conventional sources. When I say conventional sources, I mean fossil fuels, right? So let's look at the functioning of the power system, of, of the power system, right? The main objective of the power system 
has always been to generate enough electricity in order to match the demand at all times. Uh, they say in the jargon, we need to keep the lights on all the time. Okay. So on the left side of the balance, you will see all the generation resources that you know you will have nuclear power plants, you will have coal power plants, uh, heavy oil driven power plants, you will have geothermal power plants, PV solar and so on. So all these power plants and that will ensure the supply. And on the right side, you are going to have the electricity consumers that we usually group and the domestic, industrial and commercial categories. The thing is that electricity demand changes over the course of the day. So therefore, suppliers need to generate more electricity when demand is high, and then they need to generate less electricity when demand is low. So that's the simple equation. So let's have a brief overview of how power systems traditionally operate. When I say traditionally, I mean before the uh, coming in of variable renewable energy resources in the grid, right? So as you know, as you can see here, this is a typical uh, daily electricity demand profile in Mauritius based on seasonality. So this is a typical, uh, in gray, you will find a typical winter day, and in brown, you will find a typical summer day, right? So you can see that the demand changes over the course of a day, over the course of 24 hours, right? So this is one represents the peak demand. And for example, at 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, at, at midnight, but you will find that the demand during a typical summer day at midnight is about 60% of the peak de demand. So then it will decrease at night and during the morning, as people we, we wake up, switch on their lights, switch on appliances, the demand will increase, right? Offices start to open, it increases, AC and so on operate, it's going to increase. And then as offices start to close in the evening, the demand will decrease. And at night, as lights come on, domestic appliances come on, AC comes on during the, the summer, it's going to increase again to reach another peak. And then at night, it decreases again. So the utility knows about this typical profile. So we know, for example, that today, right it's a fr friday so our demand will be more or less like that tomorrow and uh, the day after weekend the demand will be different the demand profile will be different but the utility knows how it's going to be it's predictable okay so what they have to do they have just to ensure that we have adequate electricity generated by power plants at all times to consistently and reliably meet this demand okay so before the advent of wind and solar energy, you, we use large conventional power plants whose output could be precisely controlled. And these power plants were scheduled to generate electricity during the day, depending on the demand. Okay. So I'll, I'll come to more on this later on when I speak about VRES. Okay. So any fluctuation during the, the, the day is balanced by a matching adjustment in the output of the generation fleet. Right, and since they are pre predictable, it's e it's quite easy, relatively easy for the power plant operator to actually uh, schedule the operation of the power of the generators. Right now, as we have seen earlier, I've told you uh, earlier that wind and solar, the, their characteristics are completely different with that of uh, conventional energy source sources. So. Let's have a look at the characteristics of wind and solar energy and how they are going to disturb the traditional way power systems operate. In this slide, I'm showing you the variation of solar radiation during one day in an area in the United States. Okay, so uh, if we have a clear sky, clear sky means that the sun is shining bright during the whole day, then we are going to have the smooth red curve here, okay? It's bell-shaped as you can see. But then you, you know that clouds move across the sky during the day. And from time to time, they are going to cover the sun so that the solar radiation incident on the earth is going to vary with time, right? The problem is that the moments at which these clouds will come or their density, we don't know about them, 
we cannot predict them with much accuracy. We can say, okay, meteor can say meteorological station can tell you that there will be uh, to, today tomorrow will be cloudy, but they can't predict the exact instant at which it will be cloudy or what's the density of the clouds at a specific time. It's the same thing for wind energy, where the wind speed, the wind intensity, and the direction of the wind is going to change frequently. So the output of the solar PV panels and the wind turbines are going to be highly unpredictable. This is why we refer to them as intermittent or variable renewable energy sources. Okay, Intermittent means, right, limited control on their electrical output. And we cannot predict them with accuracy in advance. Of course, there are a lot of research that is being done in view of improving the forecast of solar and wind power. But the errors are quite large, right? More so when we try to predict 24 hours ahead or more, right? So in using solar and wind energy, we are introducing uncertainty on the, gen on the generation side of the balance, right? Of the demand supply ba balance. Earlier, we saw that our pa traditional power systems are used to manipulating uh, variation on the demand side. Now the intermittency, the variations are going to come on the supply side as well, and they are going to be more pronounced. Okay, so uh, so what does it mean on the generation side now? The generation side means it means that it entails that we are moving from a stable and controllable supply to a more uncontrollable and less predictable supply. Okay. Now, let's have a look at another figure, right? So this figure shows, okay, the total electricity demand on a power system, right, in the United States during a one-week period. So during seven days, this is the total load shown in yellow here, the total demand, electricity demand on, for that power system during one whole week. So you can see every day you have, it's quite predictable. The total electricity demand is quite predictable. Every day you get two peaks, right? So it's quite more or less the same nearly every day. Of course, there are small changes, but they are more or less the same, okay? Now, if you look in green here, green is the amount of wind energy that is being produced by this power system, right? So you will see at times, right? Wind energy is nearly 40% of the total electricity demand. Here it's five units. The total demand is about 12 units, 12.5 units. So it's about nearly 40%. So it's quite a big amount of wind energy that they are placing on the grid here. Okay. Now, because of financial and environmental reasons, when I say financial reasons, it means economic re reasons, you know, that wind energy, the fuel for wind energy doesn't cost a cent. Environmental reasons, I mean, it doesn't generate uh, greenhouse gas when it's, pr it's producing uh, wind energy, right? So for these re reasons, power system planners normally, first of all, they dispatch whatever renewable energy they are producing. Dispatch means they send it to the grid. So they send it, uh, they send it on the grid to meet this, the, the, the demand. So once that they have uh, dispatched the wind energy, whatever is left on the demand, this is shown on in red here. This is shown in red, and it is called the net load. So how do we get the net load curve? The net load curve, we take the total demand at each instant, and we subtract the renewable energy output at this instant. And we do it for all instants, and we are going to get this type of curve. Right now, the first thing that you can see from this curve is that the net load curve, okay, it is not at all right predictable as predictable as the total load load curve. You can see it here, right? It is not at all predictable. Okay, you can see the two right the two peaks that were here. Here you have a new one one peak now. Here also you have a new one peak. Here the demand the net load has decreased considerably. Good. So these, and so what are the other characteristics of this net load curve? The net load curve, you will see you have 
steeper peaks, uh, steeper ramps, right? You see the steeper, steeper ramps compared to here. Here also it's a very steep ramp going down. So what is important to note is that these, this net load curve, whatever demand that is that remains after the renewable energy has been dispatched, these have to be met by the conventional power plants, right? The coal power plants and so on and so forth. Okay, so these have to be met by the fossil fuel fired power plants. Now, the problem is that these fossil fuel power plants, normally they are not used to decreasing their output or increasing their output rapidly, right? To meet the, the, the remaining demand, right? Like here you will see also that the peaks, they are very short duration, right? Compared to here where it's more stable, the peak. Right? So these, so everything is going to change now because these conventional power plants, they have to meet the net load instead of the total load. Now, another thing I would like to point out, here we have considered a case where wind energy is quite significant. Let's consider a case where the wind energy is very low. The wind energy generated is very low. Let's say about one, one unit or two, one or two units, right? Let's say about this level. So in this case, if the wind energy is quite low, about one unit here, the difference between the, uh, the total load curve and the net load curve will be very, uh, very insignificant, right? So they will be more or less similar, which means at, at, at low rates of VRE integration, there's no problem for the power system to cope with these variations because they were going to be similar to what they encounter on the electricity demand. But as the VRE integration increases, like in the case here, then we are going to have significant differences between the net load and the total load curve. So let's just summarize. I've been telling a lot of things on this curve. Let's just summarize what I've mentioned here. To, so to summarize, we have just seen that large scale VRE integration in the electricity grid. The process of balancing supply and demand is going to be more challenging due to the higher frequency of occurrence and magnitude of some events in the net load profile. What are going to be these events? These events include rapid variability, steeper reps both in the up and down directions, and peaks as well as troughs are going to be of shorter duration in the net load profile. So as a result, right, the variations in the net load curve are much more difficult to predict than those in the load, in the total load. And one more thing we saw is that the net load has to be supplied by fossil fuel based generators. So what does it mean? Let's suppose I ask you to do 100 sit-ups right now. Sit-ups, you, you know, standing and, and uh, sit, sit, sitting on the ground, okay? Of course, your body needs to be very flexible to do this. It's the same thing for the power system. If you ask the power system to, to decrease its output and then immediately increase its output, right? To, search, to shut down and then immediately to, to, uh, to, to start, the, the conventional power plant is not used to doing such thing and it cannot do such thing. It doesn't have the capability of doing such, such things. So it means we need to have other sources of flexibility, right? So now that I hope you have understood what power system flexibility is all about, let's look at the definition. This is a standard definition given by the IEA, the International, Ener International Energy Agency. So according to this IEA, power system flexibility is the ability of the power system to reliably and cost-effectively manage the variability and uncertainty of demand and supply mostly supply, right, across all relevant time scales, that is instantaneously at this instant or in the long term, right, in one week, in two weeks, in one year, right, we have to ensure that the power system is able to follow the variability and uncertainty in the demand and supply now. Earlier it was only demand, now it's supply also with more pronounced variation and variability. Now, the good news I have for you is that flexibility has always been a characteristic of all power systems, right? I told you, 
uh, power system used to follow the, the, the demand profile, electricity demand profile. So it needs flexibility to do this. And at low levels of VR integration, the fluctuations in the renewable output will not lead to six, uh, significant differences between the total and the net load profile. We've already seen, seen this. So consequently, the power system can deal with very low levels of uh, renewable energy integration without much issues, right? The issue arises when these fluctuations, all right, when VR integration increases and this, these fluctuations become more prominent. Okay, so uh, up to now, okay, we have seen that as VR integration increases, right, the challenges to power system flexible uh, stability are going to increase, right? So the question that you might be asking your, yourself at this stage is how much flexibility, how much more flexibility are we going to need? And from where uh, is this flexibility, additional flexibility going to come from? How are we going to get it? This is exactly what we are going to look at in the remainder of this talk, right? But the, at the outset, there are a few things that I want to, to make clear, right, before we move on. So these are things that you should know. The first and foremost, no two power systems are similar, right? If you, for example, you can't compare the power system of Mauritius to that of Bangladesh. Each power system has its own characteristics and hence its inherent flexibility resources. Secondly, when you plan for additional flexibility, it's not an, an exercise over one, one week or one month. It's an, a long-term and constant continuous process, right? That, so if you perform it much in advance, it's going to tra successfully transform the power sector, right? Before, another thing that many people mis uh, do, do this mistake, you know, beyond a certain threshold of VRE integration, let's suppose beyond 20% or 15%, depending on the power system, if you want to provide additional flexibility to a power system through a single measure, it's not a rational decision to take, right? Many people think that we just put batteries, right? It's not going to be a rational solution, right? Instead, what we need, we are going to need a portfolio of measures to provide the additional flexibility required by your power system, okay? Thirdly, there's no one size fits all solution for all power systems. That is what works for Mauritius is not going to work for Bangladesh. Each power system, remember, has its own specificities. Once we know that a power system requires more flexibility, right, then we need to determine the best mix of flexibility solutions from an operational economic planning perspective. There are tools that allow us to do this, right? So you should be able to use the proper tools. Finally, the final point is that Practical experience has shown that it is possible to achieve VRE shares of 60% or more. Countries have achieved it. I'm going to show you in the next slide, right? Without many issues, but of course they have planned. It's not something that came overnight. They have planned it for more over more than 40 years. Good. So in this slide, right, what I'm trying to show you is that the international Energy Agency has developed a framework to categorize different phases of VRE integration that will capture the impacts that VRE may have on the power system, right? And also the integration issues, the grid integration issues. So as you can see, the integration of VRE has been categorized into six different phases. Each phase will require different measures to, right? to support system flexibility. These are mentioned here, right? You will see it in the slides a little later on. So, uh, for example, the phase one and two are initial stages where you have only minor uh, VR integration. Phase three and four, you can see in phase three, this is where the net load is going to have greater variability as from phase, phase three. Phase four there, normally in phase four, you have got up to 40 to 60% of integration of VRE. Phase five and six, this is where you go beyond 70% and so on. This is where you are, phase six, you are targeting to have 100%. So right now, 
many countries have reached, I mean, a few countries, not many, a few countries have reached phase, phase four. So in this slide, what I'm going to, I'm going to show you, right, the VR integration rate that has been achieved in some selected countries and their corresponding system integration phase in which they are. Okay, as you can note here, many countries are still in the in phases one and two, right? And they have less than ten percent share of VR reintegration in their annual electricity production, right? Nevertheless, we can see that there are a few, right, countries, Ireland, South Australia, and Denmark, or regions like South Australia is a re region that have achieved, okay, that are in phase four. Right, so Denmark, which has, uh, which is in phase four, six more than sixty percent of VR integration. Incidentally, Denmark is also the leader in wind energy integration. It reported wind power shares of forty-four percent in two thousand and eight. Ireland, for wind energy, it was at twenty-seven percent in two thousand and eighteen. So the main takeaway from this slide is that, right, from these countries' experiences, is that things didn't happen from one day to the other, right? The power systems of these countries have engaged into transformation process since many years. In fact, in Denmark, you know, the first uh, wind farm was installed in back in 1979. So you can see how long it has taken them to reach here, right? Good. So the question again, which I haven't replied yet, where does the flexibility come from? Okay, several options, in fact, are available to scale up the power system flexibility. The most popular ones are mentioned here, right? You will see dispatchable power plants. This is the power plants I was talking to you, the, 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 the coal, the uh, nuclear power plants and so on. Energy storage, transmission reinforcement, demand side management, electric vehicles. So may, maybe these terms don't mean much to you, but I'm going to explain each one of them in a few minutes, right? So the good, the good news again, I have a good news, right? That, right, the primary store, source of flexibility still comes from conventional fossil fuel generators. Now, what is the flexibility? What do I mean by flexibility of conventional generators, right? I try to draw an analogy again with the human body. Right? So this is like me, you know, I'm trying to touch my toes here. Of course, you'll agree with me that it's not very flexible, right? I agree with you also. Of course, there are people who are more flexible than, than, than me, like here. And then, you know, you have people who can do this, right? People can do this. So you can imagine difference in flexibility in the human body. So just like our bodies have different degrees of flexibility, generating units based on different technologies also have different degrees of flexibility. So uh, how do you actually quantify, evaluate the extent of flexibility provided by conventional generators? Well, you have several technical characteristics that allow you to quantify, right, the flexibility in a gen conventional generation unit. I've just mentioned the main ones here, right? First of all, you have the operational range of a generator, right? You know that a generator is designed to produce electricity within a certain operational range under normal operating conditions, right? It's bounded by its maximum capacity, Pmax, under normal operating conditions and its minimum stable gen, uh, generation level, Pmin, right? Pmin is not zero. for Coal power plant, for example, PMIN is about 40% of PMAX, meaning that if you have a coal plant about 100 mega, megawatts, PMIN can be about 40 or 50 megawatts, right? So you, it's, not, it's not zero. So another thing is the startup and shutdown times. As I told you, as soon as you press the button, the generation you, you need to start to, gen, to produce electricity and you can connect the, the output to the grid, okay? What happens, it takes time from the turn on time at which the, to the time at which the generator is synchronized with the grid. It's going to take time. So to the time that the generator reaches its minimal generation level, PMIN, and is able to come on the grid, it's going to take hours in some cases, 
right? Similarly, the shutdown time also takes hours in many cases. You can see once you decide to search, shut off your your the the, the generation uh, you you need, right? You have it has to come to uh, p min first, and then from p min to zero, it will take some time. Okay, so the shorter the startup and shutdown times of the generator, the more flexible the, the units is going to be because it will be able to provide power on shorter notice. You have also the wrap up and wrap down times. So these basically they indicate the average rate at which a generation unit can increase its output or decrease its output respectively. And it's all, all uh, normally given in terms of megawatts per hour. That is in an hour by how many megawatts can it increase its output or decrease in its output, right? So when more VRE comes into the grid, you need conventional generating units that have high ramp up and ride ramp down rates so that they can follow quickly, right? Reliably the fluctuations. And then you have the minimum up and minimum down times. What this mean? You know, when you switch off a generator, the generator has switched, been switched off, you cannot, I mean, you should not normally switch on immediately afterwards, right? This is for economic re re reasons, right? So in, in the case of a nuclear power, power plant, this can take days. You have to wait days before you can switch on it again. So this is the minimum down time. And then you have the minimum up times. It means that when you switch on a generator, it has reached its spinning and it's connected to the grid. You should not normally switch it off immediately, right? You should let it generate electricity for a certain amount of time, for some hours, because this is done in order to ensure that the operating cost and maintenance cost associated with a startup can be recovered, okay? So all these are constraints that limit the flexibility of conventional generators. So right now you should have understood that we cannot switch on off generators, just increase the, the level, uh, the output level, decrease it whenever we want. These are technical constraints, right? That we have to abide to. So let's go back to the, you remember the, uh, I showed you how the, how the traditionally the power system was meeting the, the, the supply, okay? This is how it was meeting the supply. Right? Now you will see that I've divided the supply into three colors now. Okay, so now what we have, we have the base load, the intermediate load, and the peaking load. Right. So traditionally, right, the power system is planned to meet electricity demand by stacking power plants. That is just uh, putting on power plants one after the other to meet the to meet the, uh, the, the, the demand at a specific time. So you can, uh, you, okay, so uh, the lowest blue layer that you are going to see here is what we call base load units. This consists of normally, you know, uh, heavy oil, coal, or nuclear power, power, power plants, right? And they have low operational costs, which means that they can, you can see they'll run at constant output and they run almost continuously. So these type of base load uh, power plants, right? They can they have very bad flexibility characteristics. They have very slow ramp rates. They have high minimum generation levels. They have uh, high long startup times, shutdown times, minimum up times, and minimum down times. So they were, they were very inflexible and acting as base load, right? Supplying the base load fits them very well. And then you have the next orange layer, which is taken care by intermediate generation units. So you can see here, they need to wrap up a little. So they need to have better flexibility characteristics that, than this one. But of course, the red zone here, the fast peaking units, they have better than better flexibility characteristics than the intermediate. So the top red layer of our plants is what we call peaking units because they respond on short notice to peaks in the power demand. For example, if in during a summer night, right, people are switching ACs one after the others. So we need to supply it at very short notice so we can switch on these fast peaking units because they might take, let's say, 15 minutes to switch on and to provide the power, right? So, 
So now that you know tra traditionally how these power plants were scheduled, let's have a look at the, flex the, the flexibility characteristics of conventional generators. So in, on this slide, right, I have summarized some flexibility characteristics of common uh, types of power plants that you see in most, uh, in, in most power systems, right? So I'm not included nuclear power plants, right? Nuclear power plants are normally considered as among the most inflexible, right? They require more than 12 hours to reach full operations when you switch them on, and they have minimum downtime of several days. So once you switch them off, you need to wait for several days in order to be able to switch them on again, right? So the first two, they are coal, coal-based, Lignite is a type of coal with low water con content, and you will see that lignite has the least flexibility here, right? It it can wrap only two to four percent of its uh, okay. The wrap rate is only two to four percent of its p max, right? And p min is about fifty percent or sixty percent of its its p max capacity. Started time eight to ten hours, and once Right, uptime it's about 48 hours. Once you switch it on, you have to maintain it right for 48 hours. Right. And again, once it's you switch it off, you have to wait for two days before minimum before you can switch it on again. And then you have these two are natural gas based open OCGT, open cycle gas turbine, and CCGT. You can see that open cycle has best uh, uh, flexibility characteristics among these four. It started time only five to 11 minutes, right? Uh, very low P min, uh, very low, uh, very low uh, minimum uptime and minimum down, down, down times, less than one hour, right? And you can see even uh, P min is about 40%, ramp rate is eight to 12%, so it can ramp quite rapidly, ramp its output quite rapidly. Okay, so these are typical val val values for conventional generators, okay? Now, hydroelectric tur turbines, you know, uh, they are very rapid, they are very flexible. They use flowing water to spin a turbine and they can go, they can go to from start to full operations in less than 10, 10 minutes. So they are also used as peaking units in many power systems. Combustion turbines, which use a combusted fuel air mixture to spin a turbine, they are also very fast to start, right? Now, so this is the flexibility that is available on our power system, traditional power system. And you can see it's, it's quite constrained. So where can we get additional flexibility? The additional flexibility can, the main means in fact, that power systems use, the main source of additional flexibility is by retrofitting or refurbishing, right? Improving the the flexibility characteristics of conventional generation units, right? So that they are able to operate at lower loads and they are able to ramp up and down more rapidly. So in this slide, we are showing the same table as on the previous slide, but we are also showing the technical characteristics of conventional units after refurbishment to make them more flexible. Right? So these values that are presented here are based on real case improvements that have been achieved right, in real, okay? So you will see, of course, the extent to which you can improve the parameters will depend on many factors, such as the age and the design of the power plant, okay? We can observe that significant improvements in the coal-based, right? Minimum uptime and minimum downtime, which were initially two days, now it's brought down to eight hours. Startup time was up to 10 hours. Now it's been brought down to up to six hours and as low as 1.5 hours in some cases. Okay, so you can see how we, through right, refurbishment, we can actually, by redesigning, we can actually bring, enhance the flexibility of our conventional generators. Okay, so many power systems have enhanced the flexibility of their conventional generation units in this way. In fact, this is the first, the first resource that uh, power systems no, 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 normally look into, right? The existing generators and how they can enhance its flexibility. 
Okay. Now, one thing you need to know, right? When you when you refurbish this, when you improve its flexibility, right? The the demarcation of generation resources as base load, intermediate, or peaking is not as clear cut as in traditional uh, power system operations, right? Why, why is it not so? Because now the base load, right, the base load units, they are able to wrap up and wrap down more rapidly. Their, their minimum up down times have changed. So they are able to follow loads now, okay? So traditional base load units really uh, operate at constant output now because they are rather required to wrap their outputs more often within their technical limits, of course, to meet the net load variations. Now, I gave you a, a, a remarkable example. You remember I told you uh, a few minutes ago, right, that nuclear plants are widely regarded as the least, if not the least, flexible generation technology. Well, you'll be surprised to know that in France, EDF, you know France, Electricité de France, EDF is the national electricity utility there. They have started working on making their nuclear plants more flexible as early as in the 1980s. And today they report, nowadays they report that if 1,300 megawatt reactor, nuclear reactor, can increase or decrease its output by 900 megawatts in about 30 minutes. That's remarkable. 900 megawatts increase or decrease within 30 minutes. And that's not everything. An average of two out of three nuclear reactors available in their power plants, right, power system. They are used not for uh, base load, but they are also used for load variations. So this demystifies the misconception that we presently have that nuclear plants cannot full load or they are inflexible base load sources of power. But as you see, it has taken many years to reach this stage. Another source of flexibility, common source of flexibility is energy storage. So it has the potential of adding much needed capacity in times of need. So it is able to ensure that there will always be power available to meet peak requirements. So it is able to manage short-term variability in the system by, by providing generation capacity at short notice, very short notice, and it has incredible flexibility. Okay, so unlike conventional generation units, energy storage has no minimum load, meaning it can operate at very low loads, right? And it has zero direct emissions. By direct emissions, I mean that it doesn't need to emit greenhouse gas. It doesn't emit greenhouse gas during its use. It can also be located nearly anywhere in the case of battery storage, of course, right? You have others like pump hydro that cannot be located anywhere. Now, another thing is when we speak of energy storage, Many people think immediately about battery storage, you know, battery energy storage system, what we normally term as BES, right, BSS. And many people also think that battery storage is the holy grail to solving the flexibility deficit in power system. That's the ultimate solution, right? But however, you will be surprised to learn that according to the Ener International Energy Agency, out of 140 gigawatts of grid connected energy storage, right? Presently, over 90% of that is pump storage hydroelectricity. I'm going to explain what it means pump storage hydroelectricity. So, battery storage represents less than 10% presently. Okay. So, having said, said this, let's have a look at key grid energy storage technologies presently available. Of course, you have batteries, which I've mentioned. You have different types and different technologies. Lithium ion are the most common. You also have sodium sulfur, lead acid, and flow batteries. Nowadays, they are also testing nanowire battery technology in labs. Different battery technologies, okay? These different battery technologies I've just mentioned, they are going to differ they're going to vary in terms of energy density, power performance, lifetime charging capabilities, 
cost and so on. But it's interesting to note that lithium ion batteries, their price have decreased by over 80% during the last 10 years, even though some countries still consider it as being too expensive, right? Then you have pulp hydroelectric storage, which as I mentioned, this is the most common right now. What it implies is that during times where you have excess renewable energy generation, you can use this excess uh, in, uh, renewable energy to pump water from a low reservoir to a higher reservoir. And then in times of high demand, right, you just release the water and through gravity, the water is going to turn a turbine to generate electricity. Okay, this is quite ingenious and it's not difficult to implement. Of course, you need to have the uh, correct topology of land. Then you have thermal storage, you have a bottle. Compressed air energy storage. So compressed air energy storage, here you compress air and store it in an underground place like a cavern until when you need it, then you just heat it a little and it's going to expand. And this expansion will be able to rotate a turbine, spin a turbine to generate electricity. Thermal storage, more or less the same thing, except that here you capture heat and store it in uh, medium like water, molten salts, or other types of working fluids for later use in generating electricity. Hydrogen cells, I think you already know, flywheels, you store electrical energy as kinetic energy by spinning a motor in a frictionless enclosure, and then you release this energy whenever you, you, you need it. Now, nowadays, a lot of work is being done on supercapacitors. I'm sure you've heard of supercapacitors. These are capacitors that has that have very high capacitance values, but with lower voltage limits. They have many benefits, like they have, they are very fast to, to, to charge, much faster than batteries, and they have longer lifetime than batteries. The problem is that they are cumbersome. Now, many of the technologies, mainly the, 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 the last ones that I've mentioned, right, they are still in their infancy, meaning that they are being developed in labs or as pilot pro projects. So only time is going to tell us whether they will be commercially available, okay? We don't know for the time being. So just a last word, right? A final word on, by, on battery storage. So in this slide, you can see the percentage of new installed capacity, storage capacity between 2011 and 2016, except for pump hydro storage, which hasn't been shown here. Right? So clearly you can see that lithium ion shown in brown here are leading the way amongst technologies other than pumped hydro. It accounted for nearly 85% right, of new installed capacity if we don't consider pumped hydro. So I'm, I'm sure that the sharp decline in price in recent years is surely for something here. Right? Supercapacitors, very, uh, it's, only, it's still in infancy, as I said. Good. So um, another source of flexibility is demand side management. Now, while the previously mentioned measures, they were implemented on the supply side, you know, uh, batteries, uh, conventional general uh, gen generators and so on, so on, they were on the, on the supply side. DSM, this as the name itself implies, it is on the demand side, not on the supply side, demand side. So what they consist of, they just consist of uh, reducing, you know, you want to reduce uh, uh, the peak load. Let's suppose at, during the night you have the peak load. So you take some of the load and you bring it to the morning, okay, where there's less, less load, okay? Or you can shift, that is shifting the electricity demand from one period to another, okay? So uh, some concrete examples that I'm going to give you. In Texas, USA, Right? The electrical utility there has allowed up to 25% of its load resources, mostly consisting of, from, of customers from the re industrial sector. They, are, they have been allowed to participate in what they call a responsive reserve service. So these customers, they can quickly respond to any request from the power system operator and help balance the power system. So they can decrease their, 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 their uh, consumption, or they can increase it depending on what the power system requires, okay? In France, 
the majority of households have what we call time of use tariffs. What is this? It is a tariff that allows us allows them to pay a higher price for electricity during peak demand hours and lower prices during off-peak hours. Now they have noticed that such a tariff have, have given them incentives to use high wattage appliances like electric water heaters during off-peak hours, right? Now, it, the, it is estimated there are about 13 million electric water heaters in France, and this corresponds to about eight gigawatts of load. Just imagine if you can shift, they have been able to do it, shift eight gigawatt of load of electricity demand during peak hours, which occur uh, in winters at night, you can shift eight gigawatt and bring it to, to the morning. How this is going to help you in balancing supply and demand when more renewable energy is coming into your, your grid. Okay, a final example, smart one. You know, in Southern California, USA, they have implemented a smart charge program for the charging of their electric vehicles. So this smart charge program, what it does, it uses electric price signals to identify periods in which high amount of renewable energy is available at low cost. So an electrical vehicle, an electric vehicle user, it can determine when he will connect Based on these six signals, he can determine when he will connect his electric vehicle to the grid for charging and up to what level he wants to, to, to charge. Of course, he's going to do it when price is price of renewable energy is low, all right, and during the morning or when the demand is low. This is when price. So you are able to shift the demand, right, to decrease the stress on the balance supply exercise. Okay. Now a last uh, supply, a large last resource of flexibility in power systems. Now this is going to apply. It doesn't apply to any countries like Mauritius, not applicable. But it applies to countries which share borders or to countries with multiple states, each having their own system operators, right? So a power system that is interconnected with those of neighboring regions, states, or countries has the potential to respond to fluctuation in its net load by tapping into the flexible resources of neighboring networks. So for example, uh, a country has three or four countries with which it's shareable borders, it can interconnect with them. Of course, we need to have the transmission infrastructure for this. So this is going to enhance the flexibility while decreasing net variability of both renewable output and load. Right? So I'll give you the example of Denmark. I told you earlier that Denmark has been able to achieve six, more than 60% of VRE integration rates, right? Denmark has interconnectors with its, between its power system and those of Norway, Sweden, and Germany, right? So what this means is that given that Denmark has high installed wind capacity, right, it can sell wind power to its neighbors during times of excess generation, wind generation, right? It can sell it to its neighbors and it can also buy solar power from them or hydropower when Denmark's wind output is low. So you can see how uh, helpful it is to have interconnections, okay? So you will notice that in this slide, I have, uh, uh, I have uh, put curtailment, right? in, I have underlined it and I put it in bold, right? This is another, right, another source of flexibility, but it's a last result. It's a resource that you use in last result. What does curtailment mean? It is, it means purpose, pur purposeful reduction in renewable energy output below levels that could have been produced. For example, let's take the case of Denmark again. So what would have happened to the excess wind generation if Denmark's power grid was not interconnected, right, to its neighbors, right? What would have ha happened? It would have had to uh, just get rid of it, either reduce the output of its uh, wind wind turbines, right, by reducing the speed of the of the blades. Okay. So 
A recent study conducted by the Institute of Energy and Environmental Economics has found that overgeneration is inevitable for VRE, penetration rates of 33%. And overgeneration is pervasive, that is, it happens nearly every day, right, beyond 40% of integration rates. Now, in case this excess renewable energy generation cannot be exported to another grid, or it cannot be used by, I mean, it's more than you, you, you need on your power system, right? But then control curtailment of the VRE output can be used as a last resort to meet the flexibility needs, right? Because otherwise your, uh, your power system will be unmanageable, right? Stability concerns, okay? I, I repeat last resort because curtailing renewable output result in less lost opportunities to generate carbon free power so these are the main types of uh, sources that you have for flexible for flexibility in power systems right so i would like to conclude here because i've nearly won one of them sorry for, for that on major research flexibility research questions that arise that may arise now 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 it is right so what are the major flexibility research questions that power system planners are speaking about, that researchers are speaking about, right? So to conclude, I would like to say that ensuring that the power system of the future has access to flexibility in sufficient quantities, and it is important this, at an affordable cost will imply that we address some key questions. So what are these key questions? First of all, how much intermittent renewable energy can the power system support without major changes, right? Without needing major changes, major investment, right? And when will new flexibility services be needed? So, right, so this is the first question that we need to answer when we're planning for flexibility. Another question is how do we measure the flexibility of power systems, right? How, for example, if you want to determine how much flexibility Mauritius power system or Bangladesh power system has presently, you need metrics to do that, right? My colleague Saeed Hassan, who is here today, uh, Dr. Saeed Hassan and myself, we have worked on one such metrics. Our research group has developed one such research metric. There are many others, and there is still scope to develop others. What flexibility services need to be replaced and which one will need to be developed? Okay, you know the status, once you know the status of your power system, you have uh, determined how much flexibility you, you need. So how you you determine the best, best portfolio among all the sources that I tell, told you, which one are you going to choose? This is an optimization issue, right? You have many choices and you have uh, limited resources. This brings us to the fourth, fourth question, how much will these new services cost. So this is an, another multi-objective optimization crop problem, right? What can be done to reduce these costs and keep them low? Okay, again, related to the fourth question. So these are the major research questions on which people, researchers are working nowadays, okay? So on this, I hope I've been able to give you a brief overview of why our power systems need more flexibility as the VRE integration increases, right? What are the sources of flexibility that exist that are at our disposal? And what is the status nowadays, right? I'm not entered into the technical aspects of, of, of it because I want, wanted to keep it quite basic for our students, okay? Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Uh, thank you, Dr. Henri. Uh, very nice presentation. It was very fruitful and uh, informative. I'm sure our attendees have learned quite a lot from you today. And uh, now yeah. I think we'll go ahead and take some time for questions now. We already have a few questions from uh, Tarun. We have, does the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns have an impact on the electricity production? from both renewable and non-renewable energy sources? And if so, what has been made to overcome these issues? Right, so uh, of course, COVID-19 has uh, had an impact on our, uh, on, on our uh, electricity demand pro profile, you know. Uh, 
many people are working from from home so the demand profile has changed right so uh if we if we refer to traditional power systems where there's not much vre so our power system planners are able to as long as on the demand side there's no 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 issue right as long as the change is come on comes on the demand side there's no issue our our power system planners know how to deal with it but i've read that in the us covid has had a, a, an issue on the generation part also right in the in the uh, in the generation part vr integration right uh, now they are they are trying to deal with it they are trying to to learn lessons from 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 it right so these things as i said they don't happen overnight they have to analyze the data they need to analyze the the, 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 the data that they are get, getting and they need quite a few months or a few years of the, the data to be able to understand properly the uh, what we call these uh, deviations from the normal trend okay so work is being done but if you are talking, if the question is about on the demand side, there's no issue. There, of course, COVID-19 is going to, uh, to uh, change the electricity demand pro pro profile, and there's no not, uh, much issue in balancing this. Um, uh, we have another question from uh, Shamil. Yeah. Apart from the implementation of a new tariff system, what other methods exist to reduce increase or shift electricity demand in a specific time period? So I've given you three examples in my talk, time of use, which is used in France. I've told you about the initiative in, in, um, uh, in, in the US, right? In the California, where they are using electric vehicles. So they charge it in the morning, they charge it at times where the demand is low. And these, the batteries of the electric vehicles, they can also act as battery storage at night. So this is another way. So at, at night or at times where the energy demand is high, right? Then we can also use these batteries from EV to provide additional flexibility, okay? Now, we've seen another case, uh, another example I gave, gave you in my talk in Texas, where they are using uh, industrial customers. So they just send a signal to the, of course, there's a whole infrastructure that goes beyond it. It's not just like, the, the operator gives, gives a call to, to the supplier, to, to the customer, and tells him, please decrease your, 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 your electricity. There's a whole infrastructure, communication infrastructure that goes behind all, all, all this. So signals can be sent, let's say, 30 minutes in advance to the, to the supplier and tell him, OK, the supplier must be willing to participate in this program. Now uh, the demand is increasing. I want you to decrease your demand, if possible, by 10, 10, uh, I don't know, 10 kilowatts or, or two megawatts, right? So the, there's a communication that goes automatically between the two uh, control systems of the supplies. So by this is another way, you know. I told you they are they have implemented it in uh, in Texas, where up to 25% of customers, industrial customers, have accepted to. Uh, to participate in such a program. So they are willing to decrease their, their, their load when the operator wants it, and they want they are, they are willing, of course, uh, depending on the, their operational constraints also, right? So they are, but they are willing to increase or decrease. Uh, Unfortunately, I mean, uh, we haven't had anything like time of tariff in Mauritius. I don't know if such is the case in Bangladesh, but there are other solutions, like I mentioned, except apart from time of time. Uh, thank you very much for this answer. We have another question from Feza Rana. What yeah. is the ideal percentage amount of energy storage with respect to production capacity of a power plant for good variability? Now, this brings me to, to the caution that I gave during my, 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 my talk, you know. Uh, there's no no two power systems which are alike, right? If one power system has found right, like they need, like Mauritius has just bought 18 megawatts of battery storage, right? So if another system power system tries to implement it, right, use the same model, it's not going to work because each power system already has its inherent flexibility. So to answer to this question, if you want to determine what 
level of access to which you, you, you need. You have to first analyze what are the uh, flexibility resources that you have presently in your conventional gen generation, right? So you have to analyze what type of uh, variations you, you, you get on your, on your intermittent renewables, okay? The intermittency of the renewables, how we determine it, we use you know, high resolution data, minute by minute data of power, of wind power output, solar power output over several years. We have to study this. When we know what type of variability we are going to get, we are not, even then, we are not sure that we are going to get this type of variability in the future. There can be changes, of course, be changing climate and so on, right? So there's a study, there's no, I cannot say 10 percent, 30 percent. There's no. It depends on the power system. It depends on the internal characteristics of the power system, and so on. The good news, again, I have a lot of good, good, good news, right? Is that there are tools that are available nowadays that allow us to analyze our power system and to determine how much we need, right? But before using these tools, we need to have the data, which many power systems presently don't have sufficient data to use the tools I'm talking about. Thank you for this uh, answer. Uh, we have uh, a, a question from uh, Mr. Ashwin, who is normally responsible for the energy storage, the producer, the consumer, or the regulator? Uh, it, it depends on the country, right? It depends on what type of power system you have, vertical, uh, uh, horizontal, or not. If you take the case of Mauritius, where you have the CB. Uh, which uh, is responsible for stability of the grid, right? Even though we have IPPs and so on, but it's the CB which is responsible for stability of the grid. So in the case of Mauritius, where it's centralized, so it's CB who is responsible of putting the, the, the uh, energy storage, right? But in other countries where you have a free market, you know, nowadays in some countries, the US and so on, electricity is sold like on the stock market, right? You, 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 you have uh, you have a generator, you have a solar farm. You say tomorrow I'm going to sell my electricity. I don't know so so many dollars per, 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 per megawatt, and then the utility will decide whether he wants to buy it and so on. So in this case, in other countries where there's a free market, right there, a in an IPP or it is a company can come up and say I'm setting up like. Uh, 20 megawatts of battery storage, and I'm going to sell the power to the utility if he wants to, to, to buy it, right? So this is, it depends on the country. It depends on the regulations that are in force in the country. In Mauritius right now, it's uh, it's a CB, CB, the utility who does it. I don't know in Bangladesh how, how, how it happens. So it, to answer to the question, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the regulation and the utility that dictate it. Thank you, Dr. Ori. Uh, we'll be taking only two more questions because uh, of the time constraint. We have quite a lot to do. Yeah. Uh, another question. Can we integrate waste to energy to the VOES systems? Of course we, we, we can. In Mauritius, it's, uh, I think we have one station. I don't have the capacity in mind. But we do have one at Marshikos. Uh, I think uh, in Mauritius, we do have waste to energy that is in integrated to the grid. The capacity is not much when we compare to the peak, peak load of the country. But in other countries, it's, it's being done. Also in Denmark, I mentioned Den Den Denmark is being done there. So of course, it's being done. It's, uh, uh, it's controllable also. It's not intermittent when we talk of, uh, of renewable sources like waste to energy, because we can control the amount of waste that is being uh, that is being supplied to the to the generator, so it's controllable. So it's very. Um, I mean, it's it can be easily added to the grid. Um, one last question: How important is the accurate forecasting of weather important towards the design for the flexibility of a system? I would say it's really very important. If we take the best example, the best case example of Denmark again, I'm referring to Denmark because it's a lot because it's the, the best example. They have achieved more than 60% in, in the diagram you saw it. So in Denmark, 
they have developed their weather forecasting so much. I mean, they have reached an advanced stage. And this, you know, it's not only on the, uh, it's a lot of machine learning in, in, involved in weather for, for, for forecasting. And machine learning, you need to have a lot of the data. As I said, high resolution data. High resolution means minute by minute, sub minute, right? Seconds by seconds, or 15 seconds by 15 seconds the data over a long period of time, over decades in some cases. So your weather forecasting system is going to learn from this past daily data. And based on the actual conditions, it's going to, uh, it's going to uh, pre predict. So Denmark reports that it has reached a, a certain degree of accuracy where the variability is no longer important, right? It can, it, that's how it has been able to reach up to 62, 63% of your reintegration. And they are targeting uh, 100% before 2050. So they, are, they have uh, improved, optimized their weather forecasting at, to such a degree that, right? So I would say that it's very important right, to have weather forecasting more so if you have intermittent, a lot of intermittent VR, uh, VRS in your grid, wind and so, solar. So it's very important to have beyond a certain de degree, beyond 20, 25 percent, it's very important. OK, so uh... Uh, it looks like uh, we have come to the end of our presentation. Thank you for your answers, which all has been uh, spontaneous, and we really appreciate uh, it. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Ori? Yeah, I, I just would just like to thank all the participants to, to today, right, from Bangladesh and from from, from Mauritius, to uh, for your kind pay, pay patience with, with me. And as as you said, there are many questions. So my, you have my email address. Right. If you want to send send questions, please feel, feel feel free. And for my students, students from the University of Mauritius, if you want to more information, anytime you can send me a mail. We can dis discuss in my office, or or we can arrange another Zoom 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 meet, meeting to discuss. So thank you very much for your attention, and hope I'll, I'll get another opportunity to talk about this. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Ori. That's it for today, everyone. We appreciate your presence and uh, we would like to thank everyone who made this webinar possible. Dr. Ori, Dr. Basu, Mr. Murdan and the IEEE EOM student branch team, the IEEE BUBT team. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, see you soon and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.